Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary Committee, January 29th, almost the end of the month of January. It's a cold, cold morning down here in Bennington. I'm sure it's even colder up in the kingdom. But welcome to Senate Judiciary. This morning's um, bill that we're taking up is S-45, an act relating to earned discharge from probation. Um, and uh, it, uh, I'm not sure the title is as, as apt as it could be about what we're really trying to do here. <clears throat> but uh, we're going to uh, first hear from Bryn Hare. Uh, I will announce that Senator, uh, many of us had connectivity issues this morning getting on, and that's why we're a couple of minutes late. But I will announce that Senator White is still having connectivity issues. So, Bryn, why don't you uh, take us through a kind of a quick walkthrough of the bill since we already actually uh, heard testimony on the genesis of the bill. <clears throat> sure thing. So, good morning, committee, for the record. Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. And uh, you did get a walkthrough of the draft of this bill before it was assigned a bill number last week. So I know you have a whole bunch of witnesses this morning, so I don't want to be repetitive, but I will do a quick summary of what the what the bill does. There are a couple of changes from the version that you walked through last week, but nothing, um, nothing really major, just some reorganization and some tweaks to the wording based on the, some of the length, the testimony that you heard from witnesses. So section one is the duration of probation section of law, and this is a directive to the courts. Does everyone have this bill, or would you like me to put it up on the screen? Why don't you put it up on the screen? I didn't print out the new copies. Is it the okay. version as introduced or a different one? This is a, as introduced. S45. Thank you. Okay, just give me a minute and I'll pull it up here. Everybody see that? <clears throat> okay, so you'll remember <clears throat> section one, this um, is the directive to the courts that provides that courts that uh, the sentencing court that put, places a person on probation can discharge that probation and terminate the remainder um, if it's warranted by the conduct of the offender. That's current law. And what is added here is a directive to the court that says, if the commissioner, if the Department of Corrections recommends <clears throat> that a person's um, the probationer's period of probation be terminated and discharged prior to the end of that person's term, or if they re recommend a deduction to the remainder of a person's term, if the court, and the court has to discharge or follow that recommendation, unless it finds by clear and convincing evidence that discharge isn't in the best interest of the person or that discharge of the person will result in a risk of danger to the victim or to the community. <clears throat> and it also provides a specific directive that the court has to set forth the reasons for denial of the motion um, on the record. And then subsection C, this is the language that um, was former, the version you looked at it was in section two. We've moved it up here to section one because it really is a, it's a more relevant in section one here as a directive to the courts that probationers aren't deemed ineligible for discharge or a term reduction if they're um, due to unpaid restitution, fees or surcharges. And I just wanted to, I'm sure the committee remembers to flag that part for you. There was some discussion um, about whether that should apply the restitution or not. I think you're going to hear some testimony today about that question there. Right. So section two, the conditions of probation. This now is the section of law that really um, is providing directives to the Department of Corrections. So the changes here are that we've added some subdivision headings. And I'm going to scroll all the way down to the new language, <clears throat> which is here at the top of page six. Um, review and recommendation for discharge. So this 
Um, subdivision D here, a, an existing law provides that the commissioner has to um, actually may file a motion requesting that the court discharge a person at the midpoint of their um, probation sentence. And so the mm -hmm. changes here make it presumptive. So it provides that the commissioner shall file that motion requesting a dis dismissal of the remainder of a person's term if certain criteria are met. And those criteria are found here in subdivisions A and B. If the person has not violated the conditions of their probation in the six months prior to that midpoint review, and the person is participating in the case plan. And I wanna flag this for you all too. You, there was some discussion about um, this language participating in the case plan, whether that language was appropriate or not. So I'm sure you'll hear more about that from the witnesses. That's where it used to say actively participating? Correct. It, and we removed okay. the word, took word, actively. word actively out. Okay. And then subdivision two provides that if that probationer isn't eligible for discharge at the, after the midpoint review, um, because they didn't meet those criteria perhaps, um, it allows that the department may file a motion to request a deduction of a portion of the remainder of the probation term if um, the person has conditions completed or goals attained. Subdivision three provides that if there, if after the midpoint review, no motion was filed, it requires that the commissioner continue to conduct a review each six months following that midpoint review. And again, we have the same language here. Um, if, the, if the probationer meets those criteria that were outlined above, that they haven't violated in the six months prior to the review, and, they're, um, and they are compliant with their case plan, then uh, the commissioner shall file a motion to dismiss the remainder of the term. And if they're ineligible for dismissal, the commissioner may file a motion requesting the court deduct a portion of that remaining term. So exact same language, six months later at each six months review following the midpoint review. Um, and that language Bryn, itself- Hey Bryn, can I yep. stop you for a second? Um, the phrase, you can have to scroll up about a half a page if you would. Okay, right there. Um, it's completed conditions or attained goals. So if there is conditions they have not completed, they could still be eligible because they've attained some goals that aren't defined. Yes, that's how I read that language. And I would just point out that there is existing, um, this is existing language. We've repeated it here. Okay. But under current law, um, the commissioner may file this motion. Yeah, um, all right. If, they've got a, if they have a, a, a history with this, and I'm not going to get too picky about it. Um, I, I'm just wondering if I'm understanding it right. We're talking about previously articulated goals, right? They, they can't, the, the would-be probationer, can't say, well, I had a personal goal to uh, do 100 push-ups a day, and I completed that. We're talking about official goals, right? Yes, and I suspect you're going to get some helpful information from the witnesses today about this, because it, I think it, it sort of dovetails with the question about whether compliance with the case plan is the right um, way to articulate that uh, eligibility criteria. I. I imagine that these goals and conditions are a part of the case plan, if that's the right word to use. Okay. Um, so it may be that we that you want to get more specific about about what that means to attain goals or complete conditions. Yeah, because as it stands, it's it's pretty loosey goosey. Okay. If we're, I'm going to move on to section three now. Um, and this is the directive to the Department of Corrections to um, gather some information about how this midpoint review process is working and report back to the Justice Oversight Committee in August of 2022 and 2023. And specifically, this is the data that they're required to collect, number of probation discharge or term reductions um, that are filed by the department, and then the number of probation terms that actually were reduced or terminated and the amount of time reduced from probation terms as a result of these motions granted by the court. And then it takes effect in July of this year, and that's it. Great. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Um, received a request from several 
witnesses to have um, Dale Cook uh, go first, who is scheduled later this morning. I assume Monica would join Dale uh, and, uh, if she's available or wants to. Um, I don't see her on the screen, so she may not be here yet. She's not here today, sir. Oh, okay. She won't be here then. That's fine. I'm sure you can handle it. Hopefully. So we'll start with Dale and then go backwards to the original um, order. Well, good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Dale Crook. I am the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, today we're talking about S45. Um, I'll kind of walk through it. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if some of the language here is a little clunky and I'm not sure it, it um, fits in how things, um, what you, what the committee or what the justice reinvestment was kind of looking at. I was kind of involved with some of those committees. So I'll try to read through it and give you, give you our feedback and, and some suggestions. Um, the first section, section, uh, section one, um, we're fine with uh, one thing I will want to talk later about is about the partial reduction of term. Um, in reality, it doesn't really it re it doesn't really work um, that well um, when it's implemented. Uh, we, we've um, we kind of have certain language like that now, and, and it just gets clunky. And I'll and explain that a little bit later. Um, the rest of this of of section uh, one uh, B, we have really no other issues with. Uh, there may be a concern about who, about the courts making the determination um, if it's in the best interest of the person or um, the risk to the public, which I'm assuming Judge Gerson will be able to, to, to talk about. Um, Section C is, is fine. Um, we currently don't hold uh, individuals on for failure to make payments. Um, that's kind of current practice. Um, that's with section one. Um, now there's just some kind of cleanup language and we'll get kind of to the, to the meat of the changes, uh, which will be on the top of page six. Um, uh, the, the, first, the, the first change and, and number one, you, you need to have um, to make a determination on is the may to shall and the shall is fine, but, the, but just to make the committee aware that the way the language is written now, sex offenders and domestic violence offenders would be included in this. I'm not saying if that is the intent or not, but but the way I would read this is that um, sex offenders would currently be um, eligible for this, and there could be conflicting language with Act One uh, from 2009, I believe, is when it came out around the department's responsibility with supervising sex offenders. Um, if it's the intent of the committee to exclude sex offenders or any other um, offense-based individuals, um, I would just um, add that language um, in there or not. It's really a policy decision to include them or not. Um, so that's with the, um, uh, the shall and the may. Um, we have a rule right now with the may and in our rule, we exclude sex offenders and do domestic violence offenders um, and behaviors that are in affidavits that could be constituted as domestic violence or sexual violence um, currently. Um, moving down to- Are those the, oh. sorry, Dale, are those the folks that are on lifetime supervision for sex offenses? Or are they just purely probation? What was that question again, sir? I didn't quite hear everything. Are the ones who, I'm sorry, are the ones who, the sex offenders, we're on probation. Are they on for a lifetime probation period? Um, de it depends. It depends if there's a term on the probation order, um, if it would or would not. If it's until further order of the court, uh, they would be on the department would not recommend a discharge for a sex offender. The criterion act one was um, unattainable in our opinion. And it's, I think it was overwhelming evidence um, is our criteria and, and we, we have been able to determine that. Um, so, but offenders can petition the court for discharge on their own. It's just that the department will not make that stance. But it really depends on what the probation 
what the probation is. But um, I, I assume some others that follow me can probably better explain. Um, not all offenses will be given a term. There are a lot of serious uh, offenses where they're put on probation can have um, until further order of the court. It, it, they just have to be able to just the courts just have to justify why they're not going with the term sentence. What? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. But we'll hear from the victims groups. I'm trying to understand if we were making certain groups not eligible. It would be those that are on probation until further order of the court, because they, they that don't be, have a specific term. Because they don't have a specific term. Those that are, this is designed for those who are um, have a you know a, mid, a midpoint, a, a midpoint, of, say a five year. So after two and a half years, you would hold a, this midpoint. <laughs> I don't know how you do a midpoint until further order of the court. We, we don't. The language currently is is for a specific a specified term, so so the offender has to have a term of probation. Well, I guess I'm asking: Does do we need to be clear about that? And, and welcome, Senator White. Do we need to be clear about that? Well, I, as it's written now, sex offenders, domestic violence, all offenders with a term probated case are eligible for this. If okay. that's the intent. That's then, then that's the intent. If it's not, I'm just making you aware. I'm not. I'm not arguing either side. I'm just saying right. uh, that may to shall is is um, right. an important piece. I, I I appreciate that, but I I guess what I'm trying to get at is those with a probation until further order of the court would not be eligible. Correct. That that does does not apply to them. No matter what the offense, as the way it's currently written. Anyone with a term probation, two years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, would be eligible at the mid. Correct. So if somebody's, say, had a 20 year probation, I don't know, did they get a 20 year probation term? They, they can be, yeah. Yeah. So after 10 years, um, if, do if, we review them anyway? I mean, under current law, do you have a midpoint review after 10 years? Years. It wouldn't if if they would have a term we would and currently unless they're sex offenders we wouldn't um, but they would have to have a term uh, so if they don't have a term um, this does not apply to them. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we'll wait for some witnesses to give us more um, thoughts. Okay. Issues. Thanks for okay. raising it. Um, uh, the next section, uh, the section A about uh, has not been found a violation of conditions, that, that's fine. Um, B starts getting into to language that's not really um, applicable for, for probation. Um, really with probation, the understanding is that the probation conditions are really kind of drive everything. Um, the case plans uh, don't really drive probation conditions. Um, so I, So having a case plan we could have things in the case plan that aren't connected to the probation conditions, um, and we have would have no authority to, as a department, to have the offender complete those requirements in the case plan. Um, I would mm -hmm. I would make a, a, a suggestion that B would be changed into um, instead of participating, successfully completing the conditions of probation. Um, that's that's kind of what the judge set forth the agreements is here are the conditions. A probation that the offender needs to complete in order to satisfy his probation requirements. Um, that's, I think, cleaner in our opinion. Um, and of course, you can hear from others behind me. Dale, um, would it be completing the conditions or currently complying? I would recommend completing. Um, just complying, they may not be completing with their risk reduction programming. Um, some programs may take longer than what's at the midpoint. Um, this, you know, someone has a, a, for example, some of our sex offender programs can be two years. If, if after halfway through they're completing, I don't know if it would be in the best interest to discharge them before completing treatment. Well, I, maybe it's a semantic thing. I, I thought that conditions were ongoing 
while you were on probation. Correct. So at the midpoint, you wouldn't have completed them. You, you would be in current compliance with them. It, it, you, see my, you see my point? I, 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 yes, but it's, we have the standard conditions allow for the supervision of the offender, the special conditions of- What, what about uh, satisfied? Has, has satisfied? That's, that's fine as well, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, okay. Satisfied or completed the conditions. Is, is... Because completed makes it sound like they're done and in the past, but actually they're still in force. Um, and I have a hard time with the word successfully. Um, that's in the eye of the beholder, really. I, I used to have kids and we questioned, did they successfully complete the program? Whatever that means. They attained everything they could get out of that program. But you, what success to me and you might not be success to somebody else. So I, I think that's a really tough term to put in there, requiring successful completion. I mean, unless you can automatic, you know, unless you can figure. I had a boss one time who told me you can't determine whether somebody was successful until their life is over. Um, so. Uh, and he worked for the Department of Corrections, by the way. <laughs> so at any rate, I, I think we might want to avoid that term as well. I think the idea of um, Senator Baruth. Uh, no, I don't think we would object to that. I think what we're indicating is that case plan is, is it's, it really should be driven around probation conditions. Yep. conditions. And however yep. level of satisfying or completing that the committee thinks is appropriate. Um, case plan is, I don't think is, is a workable, workable um, component here. In okay. Practice. Senator Benning. So Dale, why attach the phrase probation conditions or attained goals? I, I think some of that was old language. I'm not, it, it, so the department's authority is driven through the probation conditions. So, so they could have goals, but the department can't enforce them. We can only, we can only do what's on the conditions of probation. Um, well, that, that's what I'm thinking. But if you have, let's say probation says, well, we don't like you leaving probation until you've found adequate housing. But adequate housing is not one of the probation conditions. Um, so you've got this internal goal or desire that could be in conflict with what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, am I correct in saying we probably ought to jettison that phrase or attain goals? I, yes, I would agree with that. I, I would, I would um, focus the language on probation conditions because that's really with probation, it, they are under the authority of the court and the department that supervises them those conditions is what drives everything with a probationer. It drives discharge, it drives violation, it drives completion dates. Um, everything is driven by the, by the conditions of probation. Goals, okay. case plans, those are things that our probation officers will work with, but we don't really have, you know, as far as casework and social work and helping individuals be better themselves, but it's something we don't really have the authority to impose upon an offender. Okay, thanks. Uh, could, could you, um, so if, if one of the conditions of probation is that they work with both rehab or get a job mm -hmm. um, or the Department of Labor, um, with, that's a condition of probation, not a goal that they have a job. Now, it, it doesn't mean that goals can't, or conditions can't be kind of geared around goals. It's really what is sit on the probation orders. And we'll have goals to help accomplish, um, we'll set goals, we, have, we call them supervision plans, which are really how an offender will accomplish his uh, probation conditions. And it may be your goal is to go get an assessment uh, by the end of the month and then follow the recommendations. That could be a goal internally, but it's not, um, but the condition is what drives that goal. The conditions of getting an assessment on a probation order is what drives Senator, Senator White is now connected and wants to ask a question. 
I am. I had to come up to the state house. I have no idea what happened to the internet at that at the house. But you probably didn't so, pay the bill. No, I did exactly what they said too. I she left a note and said disconnect it and then connect it. And anyway, so I, I just wanted to follow up on Senator Sears' question there about um, the finishing. If if the if one of the conditions is to work toward a high school diploma or um, a college degree or whatever it is, or a GED, that successfully complete, or not successfully, but satisfying that means you're continuing to work toward it. It doesn't mean you've got the GED or the high school diploma. Am I right about that? Because it doesn't say have one, it says work toward. If it it, it really depends on what the language is written down. So if it uh, says to be engaged in educational services, yeah. um, don't want to engage in educational services at the midpoint, we would, at least I would interpret that as satisfying that condition. Are there, oh. are there in compliance with that condition at that time? Okay, thanks. I just wondered. If, if the language was more specific, must obtain a high school diploma, then that is then they would have to obtain the high school diploma to satisfy that condition. Yeah, and the same with working with folk rehab toward getting a job or training or whatever it yep. is. Okay, right. thanks. Okay, why don't we move in right along, Dale? <coughs> so uh, now we're at the two. This, one, of the, one of the suggestions reading this is I, I would um, recommend removing the partial credit um, especially with where's that um, it kind of it flows down a little bit farther because um, we have the conditions and goals it's not in section two actually um, I'll continue I'm sorry my mistake um, but but with this I think it's the next up, page at the top yeah with the goals and stuff I think we discussed that um, that is really driven by the conditions of probation um, now, filing the, the midpoint um, and, and uh, number three, uh, that is fine. Where I think there would be the, the, the partial reduction of term, um, especially with how um, I think where this language is moving toward, um, makes it uh, kind of, it, it doesn't work well because if an individual, um, and I'll give an example, uh, someone has a one-year probated term, and they have four conditions to satisfy. Um, at the midpoint, they have three out of the four done. So we'd, we'd, we'd reduce, let's say, 25%, which would be what best, uh, three months. Um, mm -hmm. If the offender in that three months doesn't complete that fourth condition, we would have to violate his probation in order to extend the condition. So it's kind of like this, like it could put us in a, in a, in a situation where it wouldn't be very beneficial. It's a lot of paperwork going back and forth between the courts. Um, it, you have this six month review. Um, I would actually make a suggestion that after the midpoint review, any time the offender satisfies his conditions of probation, the department shall recommend a discharge. Actually, I, I, the, suge the CSG suggestion was that a shorter term period, and I've said six months just to avoid hassle for you all. But if you're willing to do it that way, I, I think that's okay. I, Bryn and I talked about this as the bill was getting drafted, and I thought it would be simpler for you at a six month period to, to not have somebody coming in all over the place. No, because we have um, actually, we have a most of these cases are going to be on administrative, going to be on low risk. Right. And we have an automated system that actually would work really well with um, completing this. So once well, many of them are just do not, you know, if you get arrested, give me a call, give us a call. That's the only condition, right? On some, uh, there's usually conditions. Um, um, very rarely do we have administrative probation. Um, where we have um, we have a, a telephone monitoring system that is uh, actually would work really well with this because once things are completed, we can have the system flag it and, and do it. Otherwise, with the high risk, they're meeting with their probation officer at least once a month, if not more, uh, for those goals. 
I guess one other question about this section. Over the years in working with young people, sometimes the goals or the conditions set at the beginning are not realistic as you get to know the person better and as you get to realize. So using the example Senator White gave, maybe this person just isn't capable of getting a GED. Um, that, that may actually be true. And um, so you would revise then that you can't revise the condition, but how would you deal with that if you went back to court? We could, re uh, depends on how the language is written. A lot of the language is written to the satisfaction of the probation officer. Yep. Um, so that gives discretion. So if an offender um, is not able to, to reach the job or, or whatever it may be, they may be able to do something else that right. satisfies that condition because the offender is just not capable of doing that. There's one way around. We can also file a motion and modify conditions um, with the consent of the offender. So if the offender believes that this condition um, needs to be modified, we, we can do that. Um, you don't have the standard conditions anymore, do you? There are still some standard conditions. Um, I thought the court, the Supreme Court had ruled that you were limited on that. There are a handful of, of conditions that allow the department to supervise, but all special conditions should be geared toward either risk reduction or uh, the crime itself. I see Matt Valerio popped on. He can probably explain it a lot better than I can. Um, but Well, I was, think, I was thinking of, you know, you ne shall not consume alcohol. You're 35 years old and never had a problem with alcohol, but it was a standard condition. You can't apply that condition. Is my, that was my understanding of the Supreme Court rule. Correct. It has to be connected to the crime or to rehabilitation or for supervision. Uh, are there other things, Dale, that you have uh, issues with? No, just I, I talked about the, the partial reduction. Um, uh, um, the rule section four, I'm not sure depends on how the language plays out. I'm not sure if a rule is necessary um, with shalls and, and pretty specific language and statute, a rule may not be necessary. Um, if there is, if the committee continues uh, and wants the rule, um, we would have to do emergency rules because we would never be able to get to the rulemaking process by uh, July 1. Um, I think without the rule, we'd be able to, this is, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's not really a, a, a huge lift for the department as far as um, it's just some policy work. It's not implementing, you know, a whole bunch of other components within the department. Um, the, the, the report parts is fine. I spoke with Monica um, yesterday. Um, no issues with, with the reports um, and the data and the tracking of the data. Um, any other questions for me that, that kind of covers my my thoughts and I'll be on if there's other questions if needed I don't have any anybody have any others very good thank you Dale appreciate it I'm going to go back to the original order unless there's somebody who would rather have it change which would be David Schur of the Attorney General's office Good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, morning, David, David. Chair. Uh, morning, Senator. For the record, David Chair with the Vermont Attorney General's Office. Um, the Vermont Attorney General's Office certainly supports this legislation uh, in concept, uh, and we are fine with uh, working with other stakeholders to tweak it a little bit to make sure we get it right. Um, as the committee may remember, this is sort of stemming from, this is the replacement idea for the idea that we grappled with a little bit last session around um, having probation, the underlying time on somebody's sentence run while they were serving probation. Uh, that proved to be complicated and had some uh, concerns from various stakeholders. And this is the, I would say, the replacement option that has come out of the Council on State Governments. And um, 
we think it's a reasonable replacement and support it. Um, I think that there's, there's a couple points I wanted to mention and happy to answer questions, although I think other stakeholders will have uh, more, will go into some of the stuff in more detail than I will. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep my remarks relatively concise. One thing that the committee was already getting at was the, in your, in your discussion with uh, Mr. Crook, was that how do you decide what a satisfactory completion looks like or satisfactory um, participation? What does that mean? What does that look like? I think as a general matter, the law should be phrased to make it clear that somebody who is uh, actively participating and obeying the conditions should generally speaking uh, be recommended for discharge. There is a big caveat, an important caveat to that, which is that people who are in the middle of a program, uh, like the programming that's done for uh, sex offenders, for example, uh, those programs, this should be designed in a way that people are required to complete those programs. So programs that essentially have a set course, a set time, uh, conditions, in other words, that are not conditions that you just have to meet throughout the term of your probation, but conditions that um, that require you to complete a curriculum. I think that those, it is reasonable to have those be required to be completed before uh, discharge happens. And this was actually one of the main concerns. I don't want to mischaracterize it, and, and, and Attorney Pepper can correct me where I'm wrong. But I believe that this was actually one of the main concerns that state's attorneys had with the prior idea around time running. Um, while somebody was on probation, they were concerned that if somebody didn't finish uh, required programming, like the programming for sex offenders, that there would be no way to force that completion. And so I wouldn't want to want us to run into a similar problem here. And I, I think that that can be accomplished by tweaking the language. And uh, I'm not sure if Attorney Pepper or others have specific suggestions. I'm still, to be perfectly honest, I'm still thinking about how we might achieve both goals that I've articulated, which is first, um, make sure that the default is really towards discharge, except that where there is a specific curriculum that's been required, the completion of that curriculum is necessary. Um, I think we can do, I'm sure we can do that. I just have to think a little bit more about the language and I'm sure others here will uh, have similar or, or sorry, have uh, suggestions on that line. That's my only real substantive uh, comment on this. We support the goals uh, broadly um, and I'm happy to answer any questions on it. I have a question. Mr. You're Mayor. muted, Dick. I was there talking and um, just having a grand old time. David, and I think I'll ask, probably ask everybody the question, should all offenders with probationary sentences be eligible except those who are sentenced to a term of probation until further order of the court? Because you can never determine what the midpoint is of a further order of the court. And what do we do with those folks? I think that people have been, uh, obviously it can't be a midpoint review as a matter of logic, as you correctly point out. That being said, I still think that there should be an opportunity for a review that the department conducts at some point. And uh, I have not thought about what that might look like, to be perfectly frank, but I think it would make sense and it would be in the spirit of this legislation for there to be at some point uh, some sort of review that the department conducts. And I can certainly come back to the committee with and, and talk with some of the other stakeholders about what that might look like. Um, but it seems to be, to me, to be in the spirit of the policy change here that uh, everybody gets a chance for a review at some point and, and we can think about what the timeline might be for those individuals. That's a good idea. Um, what about all crimes? I mean, given what we just experienced with um, good time. I, I don't think that the same, I, I, I say this with some trepidation, but I don't think that the same um, 
concerns are going to arise here. I'm sure that there will be some, uh, but there's two reasons why I don't think that. One is that this is, a, as I understand it, um, uh, well, so let me let me check on that. I, I believe this is a prospective change, but um, uh, I, I could be wrong about that. I could be misunderstanding the intent. So let me let me reserve comment on that and let somebody else correct me on that. But the other, the more important difference is that the very serious crimes that elicited a lot of concern uh, under the good time issue, they are very unlikely to be determined by a probationary sentence. And so I don't think that some of the really uh, intense um, concern and frankly backlash that came from that change is going to be a, as applicable here. Uh, and again, here you're not, you're, you're, there's still uh, an element of discretion. The courts can can ref, can choose not to give this. This isn't earned good time basically meant that as long as some, as you well, as this committee well knows, uh, it basically meant that, you know, the time was going to accrue as long as somebody didn't accumulate the, the DRs. And, and that didn't necessarily mean that release was inevitable. Certainly, I think that's important to remember. But I think here um, we're really talking about mostly crimes that are not going to fall into the category that raised the most concern uh, around our good time. And um, and again, courts retain the ability to uh, make an assessment about what is fair and just uh, in terms of the. Um, the actual discharge. It's obviously weighted towards discharge, which we think is appropriate, but there is still a check there. And, and Dale raised that issue. And I, I just, the language is pretty clear, clear and convincing evidence that the discharge is, in, is not in the best interest of the person or that discharge of the person will present a risk of danger to the victim of the offense or to the community. That's, that gives me some comfort in the determination of whether to release someone, they, the court could determine by clear and convincing evidence that it's not in the middle. Yeah, that's, yeah that, that's right. And again, we think it's fair for it to be weighted in that direction. Um, and again, the very serious charges that created a lot of concern are mostly are much more likely to be incarcerative sentences and, and are that it's going to be less relevant to this policy change. Senator Baruth. I'm just wondering about the chair's uh, talk about the difference between uh, a term and until further order of the court. And I'm wondering, I'm not really familiar with that, that phrase so much. Is there a, a generally understood set of cases that receive that until further order of the court? Or is that just at the discretion of the sentencing judge? It's certainly at the discretion of the sentencing judge. And those types of sentences, as I understand it, are, are relatively unusual. I will defer. I'm, I'm, I couldn't sit here right now and tell you exactly where that is most likely to happen. And so I would defer to... Uh, to uh, uh, Defender General Valerio and Attorney Pepper on that question. I, I know that some cases that end up with long supervision are the multi-DUI cases. Um, those have been in the past often furlough, long, you know, very long furlough uh, type sentences, FSU sentences. That's obviously gonna change, I think, with the recent legislation or, or could change with the recent legislation, but that's the type of offense that uh, might see very long supervision or indefinite supervision, but um, I will let uh, Defender General Valerio and, and Attorney Pepper talk more about what class of cases, in my experience, those are unusual. And then uh, just to speak to the issue specifically of sex offenders um, and how they might uh, fare under this proposed legislation. So when you talked about completing programs, curricular programs, or, or just uh, programs in general, um, I think that makes sense. That we, we wouldn't want to say, okay, you're, you're actively completing, but we're going to let you go halfway through. Um, for a sex offender, if they're assigned programming, um, what does that typically look like in terms of time limits? Is it 
is it a relatively short program or is it a program that lasts their entire probation period or how does that generally work? I, again, I think there's others here who are who oh, okay. will answer that much more precisely than me and I'd turn it over to them. I mean, my quick answer is that it's usually in the neighborhood of like a year, 18 months in terms of that type of programming. That's okay. my experience when I was practicing in court, but but that's could have changed in the last few years. So I'll let um, uh, maybe Mr. Crook can answer that. I see he's popped on. Right Dale, now. Do, you, do you want to answer that? Um, sex offender supervision um, really is driven by the offender's risk and um, incarceration, the, it starts at six months um, of, of programming in the community. It can last um, indefinitely. Uh, it depends on the behaviors. We do risk assessments. If they're not able to maintain and manage their risks or their behaviors, um, they could continue on, on uh, sex offender treatment for an extended period of time. Um, generally, it's uh, a couple of years, one to two years, depending on the risk. Um, and depending on the offense that we have um, on, on the offender. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not a clear, you have a one-year program and here's the end date. It's, it's really based on the progress that the sex offender is making in their treatment and programming. So we could, if we, if we were to reword it according to David's suggestion about uh, not just currently successfully satisfying conditions, but also completing programming, there, there could be a way of, if somebody was assigned an indefinite program, they would not be eligible automatically, right? Because they would, they would not have completed their programming, their sex offender programming. See, it, Does that make it, sense? It, yes, it, um, it gets really tricky with the language of the conditions and how they're gonna be applied um, uh, I, you know, I, I can understand where it's coming from. I think we want to make it straightforward for everyone. And if, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure there's a, a straightforward, easy solution for this. Um, it could be something where um, um, you have a level of compliance with the conditions of supervision um, and the completion of uh, criminogenic needs or risks or risk services or something of that nature. So you're really uh, taking care of, of the, um, the behaviors or the concerns or the needs that got the offender under supervision in the first place. Um, and it really starts, starts getting, getting complicated. Um, really the conditions that are set are really important how they're worded. For an example, um, and I've seen this before, there could be a probation condition that says not eligible for early discharge as a probation condition. And that would kind of circumvent all of this by, by that probation condition. Um, so there's little things like that as to the language and how it's written and how you want the department to apply, um, apply the satisfaction of that condition. Um, I don't really have- uh, I think have if I might just kind of make an administrative decision here. We're planning next Thursday to come back to this bill and I would ask that the witnesses and those that practice this and men to take a look at how do we deal with people who are ordered to further order the court and don't have a term probation. Um, give it some more thought and, and just trying to trying to work off the top of our heads isn't always the best way to, to get there. And I, I think maybe that would be a you know, give it almost a week to look at this issue and decide how we want to do it. That work? That works. Uh, other questions for David? David, thanks. We look forward to seeing you next week. And when Thank we you, Senator. Take this up again and look at that. But also some thought about if there's certain crimes that we want to exclude um, from the list. All right. Thank you. James Pepper is next representing the state's attorneys. There he is. Am I, am I coming through? You're coming through, but it's rather weak. Okay, let me get a little closer. That's better. That, okay. Um, so uh, just with respect to 
S445. Um, the state's attorneys reviewed this bill, and um, I think all of them, without exception, want sentencing, including probation, to be evidence informed. I think that CSG has given us a lot of good data that this is a this has led to a reduction in recidivism. Um, they want um, terms and conditions tailored to an individual's risk. And uh, we really do want a bright line incentive to give people motivation to comply with their conditions and to do well on probation. I think right. we're having a, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's on my end or your end. Um, okay. Let me see if I can change up my technology. On his end. He's gone. Maybe trying to get back in. The days of Zoom. <laughs> I, I will say, uh, I, I think given what we've been talking about with earn time, this one seems to me, although I, I took David's point that it was a little different, I, I think the victims groups might wind up seeing them very similarly um, for what it's worth. Yeah. Is, it, okay. is this any better? Oh, God, a million times better. Okay. Well, then let me just start over then, if you don't mind. I apologize to the other witnesses and to the committee for the delay. No, no, please do. Um, so the state's attorneys, uh, just in general, want sentencing to be evidence informed. They want terms and conditions tailored to an individual's risk. And I think what this bill importantly does is creates a bright line incentive, you know, a, a goal date um, to motivate people to comply with conditions and to do well on probation. Um, what we have, what you've heard from the other witnesses and certainly uh, all the state's attorneys to, to the last one of them agree that rehabilitative programming must be completed prior to release or discharge. Um, which I think actually can be relatively easily resolved in this draft on page six, um, just to indicate that rehabilitative programming must be completed or risk reduction programming or however we wanna phrase that. Um, but I'd like to just quickly touch um, on a, a point about conditions that are specifically tailored to supervision. Um, so one of the most common probated sentences that we see, and I'm just gonna use Washington County as an example, is for high-risk DUIs, which would be five to 180 days to serve, all suspended with one year on probation. So the kind of, the stick would be that if you screw up while you're on probation, there would be a five-day minimum and then you'd be released on furlough. Um, but that is specifically tailored to allow um, the high-risk DUI offender, six months to complete the IOP, the intensive outpatient programming, and then an additional six months of sort of interlock or supervision to ensure that that individual, that the, that the intensive outpatient programming is actually working. Um, and so th what this proposal would do is say after the six months, after the IOP is completed, that the remainder of the term would if they were successful in completing it, would be eliminated or discharged. So that's a, con that's a concern that was raised um, with respect to just kind of the, some types of supervision that uh, would extend beyond merely the programming. Um, another concern that we have is respect to some of the no contact provisions, no harassment uh, provisions with victims and, um, Often what we'll see is that a victim will allow something like an abuse prevention order to lapse when someone is on a probated sentence because there is there are these no contact provisions, no harassment provisions. And you know, I what we're we have no, I think the state's attorneys to a T have no interest in, you know, imposing a curfew on someone or housing restrictions or you know, require frequent check-ins or, or drop-ins by probation officers. 
but uh, we do have some concerns around um, victim notification and victim harassment that under the language, I'm not sure we're fully going to be addressed by a court having to find um, by clear and convincing evidence that there's no issue with a victim. Um, so, because the only, it's kind of a binary choice for the court at the midpoint, which is uh, either dismiss, discharge the person from probation or not. And it's not, uh, it's not look at the conditions, eliminate all the ones that aren't related to the victim um, and, and let the, or, and modify the sentence. It's just discharge or not discharge. Um, so I think having some flexibility there or strictly for the victim um, victim conditions uh, would be our recommendation. And I wouldn't mind uh, if there aren't any, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions, but I, I would touch on the indeterminate sentence uh, provision as well. And just quickly coming to mind, I mean, the common sentences that get, or the common convictions that get the indeterminate sentence it usually follows a two serve portion, a uh, two serve term. Um, and they're usually for sexual sex assaults, um, aggravated domestics, L and L with a child. All of those crimes um, have a statutory penalty and you could use that statutory penalty, the midpoint of that statutory penalty as the time to review. I'm trying to understand the flexibility for the victim, um, where there is a, a active victim, um, and what you mean by that in terms of would you change the clear and convincing evidence or so? How, I, how would you... That would offer judges the flexibility, and especially if you tied it specifically to this kind of victim issue, um, you know that uh, that could be a preponderance. Um, what you could also do is instead of just saying that the court shall terminate the period of probation and discharge the person, you could say the court shall review the conditions and period of probation, discharge the person, reduce the term, or otherwise modify the conditions. You know, offer some flexibility as to what the judge could do at that midpoint review, um, other than just strictly discharge the person from probation. Yeah. And again, we are very much, I mean, the midpoint reviews are currently happening. And I think that when there are not victim concerns, and you know, I would again, allow DOC to weigh in, when there are not victim concerns, um, the state's attorneys have all told me that they regularly stipulate to them. So I think when it comes down to straight programming com being completed and no victim concerns, probation, probation terms are being, um, discharged at the midpoint. Okay. Bryn, can you find out what, what Montana did about this? Can we check with CSG to find out about Montana, this issue of the victims and so forth? I, I, I would defer to Bryn, of course. Um, I did ask this at the last of CSG at the last um, working group, the, the Justice Reinvestment Working Group meeting. And um, they, they did say that a judge, judges in Montana have the ability to modify probation at any time, which I think is true in Vermont. So, uh, you know, they would probably just deny, their answer was they would probably just deny the petition to discharge and then modify probation. Okay, well, I'm, you've already got the answer that I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Other, I, I just I think that this language creates a, a very strong presumption through clear and convincing right. evidence right. that yeah. it will be discharged. Yeah. Well, that was the idea behind. It. Other questions for Mr. Pepper? Thank you so much, um, and we'll be back. Uh, Matt Valerio. Thank you for having me, um, Matt Valerio, Defender General. Um, we are happy to see this bill, um, and uh, 
<clears throat> seems like it's come quite a long way from the original concept um, and in a positive way. I'm happy to see that the Department of Corrections seems to be embracing the, the concept. Um, I am, uh, in going through the bill, um, I didn't have very many particular concerns and more of the, the uh, comments that I have arise out of the comments that other folks have had um, along the way. I'm intrigued by the department's suggestion that perhaps it wouldn't be a judicial review, but a administrative review. Um, and I actually think that we might end up with better results for the clients with an administrative review than with a uh, judicial review. Um, on, on discharge, the uh, if the same criteria are found, uh, of course, if the uh, person who seeks discharge from probation is denied by the department, then the prisoner's rights office would have jurisdiction to challenge that review by Rule 75. Um, review which they do with any kind of administrative action. Um, if it was, uh, if it went back to the court, um, you know, I, I'm anticipating that Judge Grierson may not want to add more hearings or more, uh, you know, any, anything more to the court's plate. Um, this is one of those times that I, I will say that no matter which way this goes, whether it's an administrative review within the Department of Corrections or a review um, by the staff offices, it's clearly going to add um, work to the Defender General's office. Uh, but this is the type of work um, that we would welcome, even though it is going to be, um, you know, some measure um, more work than what we have now. I mean, probation is the largest, uh, you know, kind of classification of people that we have in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. And it has been and continues to be one of the feeders of the um, incarcerative uh, um, custody portions of the, that are uh, of folks who are in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. Um, but, you know, our, our job is to try to get people onto uh, living a, orderly and industrious life as corrections likes to say. And, and uh, part of that is getting them out from the uh, restrictions that uh, probation typically puts on people. We, I was, uh, so I'm, I'm interested in how this might come out from an administrative versus um, judicial review of what goes on. Um, there was some comment on the DOC's failure to pay fines, fees, and restitution should not result in a violation. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I believe that is what they do now because it's unconstitutional to hold somebody, um, to, to put somebody in jail for failure to pay a debt. So if somebody is on probation and the only thing that they have is a fine, fee, or restitution, um, they might be able to violate the probation, but they couldn't incarcerate them anyway. Um, the uh, restitution, as you probably know, uh, is a civil judgment that's subject to collection by the restitution unit anyway. Um, and all of these things, fines, fees, restitution, Defender General Copay, <laughs> are subject to um, tax and lottery intercept to be satisfied among other collection efforts. Um, the Defender General's Office doesn't have wage garnishment and supplementary process, but uh, the restitution uh, unit does have the ability to do that for restitution. So I think that the whole issue of collecting money from, from these folks um, is not really one that should be a consideration in um, whether or not they're discharged from probation. Um, the question, that has come up, which is interesting. Um, 
and I'm happy to address is this the whole issue of you know what happens um, on page six if it remains shall and does this include sex offenders and domestic violence cases and other unsavory type cases that uh, get a lot of uh, uh, you know publicity and uh, victim uh, input. Usually somebody only ends up on a uh, probation with a further order of the court under a number of different circumstances. One is the person has a long history of criminal activity. So they might not have, they not, might not be a sex offender or domestic violence or, you know, a serious aggravated assault or something like that. But they might have a record that goes back decades um, or, you know, five, 10, 15 years, and they keep coming back on the same kind of stuff, property things. And, um, you know, they're either generally antisocial or they have a drug problem or mental health problem that prevents them from complying with the law. Um, and those are people who will get um, a, a probation, even on, you know, many, many misdemeanors or minor felonies until further order of the court. Obvious. The other thing, though, and this is important, um, I think, to, to know is that there are those cases that are very serious crimes, but they have proof issues. Um, and those people also end up with no jail sentences at the beginning um, with indefinite probation. So you will see it in sex offenses. Um, you will see it in aggravated assaults and domestics and the like. Um, where there is a problem w where the state doesn't have a, a good witness to prove the case and to get that person um, under some sort of, under the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections, there'll be an offer with a low, low minimum, all suspended on probation. Um, and you know, it might be a you know, one to 15, all suspended on probation until further order of the court, whatever the conditions are. Um, and those are, uh, those are ones where basically the state has difficulty proving their case, but they, will, they make an offer basically that the defendant uh, you know, can't refuse from a risk management standpoint. Now, oftentimes those deals end up very bad for the defendant uh, because um, you know, once you're in the system, it's pretty difficult to get out of the system with certain types of crimes, but all the defendant sees is no jail deal, I'll take it. Um, oftentimes it's better to take a jail deal and not be on probation indefinitely. Nevertheless, that's one of the other reasons why you can end up on a, uh, uh, until further order of the court, indefinite probation. They also occur with people with complex needs, people who have mental health issues, um, but they aren't bad enough to be deemed incompetent to stand trial. Um, so they get indefinite probation orders, um, and the idea is that the, the state is going to give them some a lot of wraparound services. Unfortunately, you know, that that's one of the big issues we grapple with in the criminal justice system is getting people in um, with mental health issues who, um, while not incompetent to stand trial under the criminal legal standard, um, have severe issues that need addressing and usually our criminal justice system isn't good at dealing with that. Um, of course, you also do have the, uh, the sex offenders um, who will have the indefinite uh, probation, although they don't necessarily have to. Um, and uh, the, the multiple repeat DUIs, and then there are those who, for some reason, even though, even though their crime is not at the highest level, it's not at the lowest level, but they somehow present as, as, as dangerous or extraordinarily, extraordinarily needy in some way, such that their likelihood of reoffense is likely. Um, so, as a, um, so as a result, um, they end up on probation until further order of the court. Um, the, uh, um, I think that with all of those situations, people who have experience, judges, prosecutors and the like who have experience with these types of people, 
when the individual comes up for midpoint review, those are exactly the people that the statute is designed to pluck out and say, um, you know, this person presents a danger to a victim or to the public, um, and they would should not be uh, discharged from probation. Um, all of those folks who I described, I think, probably touched a, a nerve in, in anybody uh, on the committee who's listening to it and says, yeah, well, I understand. Those are the ones that the judge or the department are not, whether it's administrative or judicial, are not going to let out under the proposal in rule in uh, S45. Um, one of the other things that I'm, I'm always concerned about, you know, and I, it comes up in a lot of different uh, um, areas that we've been talking about post sentencing is the way our um, sexual assault statutes and LNL with the child statutes continues to treat minors who are engaging in sexual uh, activity under the age of 15 with their contemporaries in school. And I, uh, again, um, repeat my call for um, us to address that uh, issue so that you don't have 16 year olds who have sexual activity with a 14 year old being subject to the adult criminal system and being labeled sex offenders um, in, in the adult system. Similarly, even 17 year olds with 14 year olds and the, and the like, basically people who are going to school together um, who are engaging in this activity. And, you know, this was part of a negotiated resolution of the, um, you know, the, what the so-called Romeo and Juliet uh, time gap that it, this occurred during the Douglas administration. Um, and I watched that unfold, um, but you know it was very much like, you know the, you know when you're eligible for deferred sentence over the objection of the state's attorney, you know some people wanted unlimited, some people wanted at age 21, and we came up with you know age 23 at some point. A very similar kind of thing went on with this, and I think we have to recognize at some point that you, we do have minors engaging in consensual sexual activity. Um, and they're not sex offenders because they do it. Um, but under our laws, uh, you can be labeled a sex offender with a indefinite life probation, an indeterminate life sentence um, with registration requirements um, going forward. Um, and I, I think you've got to deal with that whenever you talk about these uh, probation <laughs> or um, early pr parole release, all of these situations that we're talking about now. Um, I do think that it's also important to realize that uh, um, we talk about the midpoint review of individuals, you know, what, what do you do with midpoint review for individuals who have the, um, have a indeterminate life sentence? A uh, few suggestions that I have is to perhaps have the review at their, whatever their minimum sentence would be. Um, if they've been on probation, you know, say it's a, you know, five to 15 um, to, and all suspended on probation, maybe after five years, um, the, the, the review could be had or 50% of whatever the max is. So seven and a half years. Um, of course, the probationer can always move for discharge on their own um, if, they, if they want to. There's, there's always that, uh, it, it exists today. Um, but you know, if you haven't done what you're supposed to do, um, you're not going to get very far. Nevertheless, the, the midpoint review for people with indefinite sentences might be one of those types of things, the minimum halfway to the max, something like that. Um, I understand that state attorneys desire to want evidence-informed sentences and conditions based upon the individual's risk um, and while there are things that are out there that provide evidence um, to inform sentences, we have to understand and continue to understand that risk assessments do not provide evidence of individual risk. Those don't exist. What risk assessments do is create a profile of like kind individuals and how like kind individuals within that profile respond in aggregate. 
they do not tell you about the individual risk of any particular individual. And that is exactly why these midpoint reviews are important because you can have time on the ground observing what the person does, how do they um, demonstrate amenability to treatment, how do they demonstrate an ability to comply with the law and conditions. And it is a show me period um, that where the, you start to learn about that individual's um, likelihood of risk. Um, the risk assessments, while they are an easy way to take away, uh, you know, give, give some cover for, uh, you know, judges, prosecutors, and defenders and the like when fashioning sentences, they don't tell you about individual risk. Um, and uh, that's something we've got to kind of get away from the concept of, and then understand that the way we see individual risk is by what they do. Um, I just wanted to make one comment about the, the current midpoint reviews. Um, I, you know, uh, uh, Jim Pepper always comes in and says, well, these happen all the time. And when I ask my people about them, they say, some of them have never heard of them. Um, others say, yeah, we see them and we, nobody can ever remember them being granted. Um, and, uh, you know, from, a defense, from the defense perspective, um, they're really a non-factor in getting people out of jail as they currently exist or out of, uh, I'm sorry, off of probation as they currently exist. Um, so we feel that this bill is important and I think it's gone a, a long way to uh, satisfying the need to look at people as individuals and um, what their risk is um, at some point during the course of their sentence. Thank you. I hate the mute button, um, but then <laughs> if I say something I shouldn't have said, well, I'm not muted, I hate that too. Uh, any questions for Matt? Matt, thank you very much. I think you've been fairly clear. Um, I hope you'll be available next Thursday when we try to mark this bill up and make any changes to it. Yeah, I, that's my plan. Great. Thank you. Judge Gerson. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator White has a question of Matt, or did you have a comment? No, I was just going to um, actually thank Matt for the uh, comment that um, many people haven't heard of the midterm review. And I um, have had, since I've started this, have had calls from a number of people in Wyndham County who are on probation who have never heard of it at all and have never been granted a midterm review. Well, my familiarity yeah. with it is in the juvenile system where they are held, but I think it's a yearly, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Either yearly or every six months. Six months. Every six months. And then yeah. on one day, they go, is it 12 or 18 that the case has to go to court for the review? 18 for court and six for administrative. Yeah, right. Yeah, these are adults. These are no, adults. I understand that, but I, yeah. but I, what I was hoping to accomplish here was to make this midpoint review similar to what the juveniles go through when they have to mm -hmm. go to court. And DCF has to justify supervision. Judge. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. Thank I'm you, sure Senator. I'm thrilled to have more cases come before you. Well, I was in, of course, I, my ears perked up when uh, Matt uh, said something about the administrative reviews. And, um, I hadn't thought about that as an option, but I'm certainly glad to discuss it with him and, and other stakeholders uh, relating to this bill. Um, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, you know, most of the comments from the witnesses today have dealt with the latter section of, of the bill on page six, but I'd like to go back, uh, begin my comments, um, going back to the uh, section under 251, the new section B. Um, and, and I think more than anything else, I certainly understand the, the policy uh, and the, the uh, rationale behind the bill as a whole. Um, but I think 
um, like I think some other witnesses have said, it needs some clarification or what I would like to think of it as simplifying the process. And what I'm getting at is, I think it should be clear under B, if the commissioner, uh, as I read it, uh, the commissioner would be applying for discharge um, under 252 section D, the midpoint. Um, and it says, unless the court determines by clear and convincing evidence that discharge is not in the best interest of the person and so forth. And I'll, and I'll get into those conditions, but I think it should be clear that if the commissioner's office is seeking the uh, discharge at the midpoint, that it is at that juncture, it would be upon the state. The state would have the burden of proof uh, of these conditions. And I just think that uh, needs some clarification. I'm concerned and I've, I've been surveying the judges to get a reaction. Uh, hopefully I'll have a, a broader response uh, by next week. And, uh, but the initial concern is that this idea that clear and convincing evidence that discharging the person is not in the best interest of the person. I don't know. I'm certainly not familiar with that standard. It's not defined in the statute, but beyond that, I don't know. I can't imagine why it would not be in the best interest of any individual who's on probation not to be discharged or why they would not want to be discharged. And I'm not sure that that, that standard as it is, is undefined. Um, and and I don't, I'm not sure what the court or an individual judge would do with that. When, when I talk about clarification or simplification, I think if it's clear that the state has the burden of proof, I think it would make more sense to tie it to specific reasons why uh, the, the discharge should not be granted. And I'm referring to the latter condition, the second condition, and that is clear and convincing evidence that the person will present or continue to present a risk of danger to the victim or the community or as many of the witnesses have been talking about this morning, the idea that they have not completed uh, a specific uh, programming. Um, that would be two criteria that I think if the state can satisfy the court under either of those prongs, that would be a reason um, not to grant the discharge. Um, I think the first clause about not being in the best uh, person's best interest is too, is too vague in, in, my, in my opinion. Um, I think it's interesting um, and I'll be glad again to talk with the other uh, stakeholders involved in, in this process. The idea that if you come in for a discharge um, and let's assume that the state um, meets a burden or the threshold burden of that the person shouldn't be discharged would it be appropriate at that time to consider a modification of the probation conditions, not the sentence? Uh, I think there have been other bills and other discussions about uh, modifying sentences after the, at this point, statutory 90 day period, but it may be worth, and I would certainly uh, consider uh, the idea of perhaps if a person is not to discharge at that point that perhaps some of the conditions of probation should or could be modified. And I would be glad to talk with corrections as well as the other parties involved around that issue. It may be an appropriate time uh, not to revisit the underlying sentence necessarily, but the conditions that were imposed. Um, so I, I would offer those comments with respect to uh, uh, that section and if committee would like, I can uh, draft some language uh, around around those proposals. Yeah, that, that would be helpful. I, but I think we'd all appreciate hearing that on next Thursday. I'm curious about um, changing conditions. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen a probation condition um, order. Um, so I you know, I'm sure it's changed some. Well, I usually think it, it's some of the- um, they're pretty standard, aren't they? But they are, that's what I was going to say, that there are two types of, uh, of conditions. One, there's the standard conditions that you probably wouldn't want to um, uh, modify, 
um, because that's how the department uh, supervises individuals, but there may be special conditions that they have complied with and no longer have to be uh, part of the sentence. And, and I think as one of the witnesses said, once the person is under supervision, the, the department may in fact, uh, through their supervision, discover other issues that need to be addressed. So it isn't necessarily taking away conditions, but modifying the conditions to, to tailor the, the programming uh, for what the individual needs. It may be something that they have learned, uh, discovered over the course of supervision that was either unknown or not contemplated by the parties. Um, Questions for Judge Gerson? Senator Nitka, did you have a question? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, will, I will just add that um, along with the discussion about um, folks who are under on probation till further order of the court on sex offenses, and as Dale uh, pointed out, um, those petition, those requests for discharge do not come in uh, from the department. Uh, they are generally filed by the individuals without uh, benefit of counsel because they're not entitled to uh, counsel at that time. It's rare, I, I'll, I'll put it this way, it's very rare to have uh, counsel represent uh, an individual and um, the department uh, takes the position that they do not take a position on either favoring discharge or uh, not. And, and so they become very difficult. Um, there's very little real evidence other than the, the individual saying I've been on for whatever, 15 or 20 years. Uh, and, and it becomes, uh, it becomes difficult for those reasons. In other words, the most serious, some of the most serious cases we have in the department's hands are effectively tied by not being able to take a position, um, which I think leads to inconsistent decisions by the court or could lead to inconsistent. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, our next witness is Chris Fenno and I, um, Chris, welcome. Thank you for the record. Uh, Chris Fenno from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. I wanna thank the committee for inviting me to weigh in on this um, particular bill. I have talked to a couple of people um, this past week about it. And I wanted to start with the easy one because again, this uh, the idea of restitution came up and that's really not an issue for us. That, you know, whoever said it, I don't know if it was um, Pepper or Matt, that in fact, getting off of it currently does not require the, the full payment of restitution. And that is in fact what the restitution unit is charged with collecting. And so they will do that. Um, there might, might be a restitution order that, that actually um, gets negotiated for payment plans or those kinds of things, but it's not a, it, it is not a barrier to um, getting off of probation. Um, and, and it was true, we do collect uh, lottery winnings, um, tax returns, those kinds of things for the state. Uh, so looking at the bill itself, many of our concerns, um, and I, I appreciate that, I think that when people come back next week, uh, a lot of these are gonna be uh, addressed. Uh, and I would second what Pepper's testimony was, and that is that um, we have some, and many people said this, we have concerns that the, if there is a program they are doing, that it must be completed. So, you know, it, it just makes sense. You wouldn't wanna, because it won't be completed if, if uh, somebody is taken off of probation. Uh, we have concerns and one thing I can do between now and next week is have a conversation with the network and, the, and, and actually put out a, a question for, how many, how much are they seeing uh, that 
victims of domestic violence are not um, continuing their protection orders if they have one, because they, they're not going to be able to be, it, it, it's moot because they have conditions on their, their probation already. And so I am unaware of how big an issue that is, but it is an issue if people aren't getting, aren't going and getting those renewed and they need to have them. Um, so that, that is one concern. And the other is around notification of victims to victims that, uh, that this probation is ending because a lot of victims look at what the sentence was, they look at what the probation was, and they do the math. So just wanted to make clear how or what notification was going to happen, or even if it does happen, about um, an offender uh, being able to, at the midpoint, uh, get off of probation. Those are really the, um, the issues that we had. And as I said, um, I can, I'm planning to talk to some more people and maybe the um, victim advocates in the state's attorney's office to just get a feel for what they think this might be the impact. Um, and I can certainly come back and, and talk about that. Good. Uh, maybe we should actually, in, for next Thursday, uh, invite the victim, the, the network against domestic violence and sexual assault to testify on the bill. I think but that's also um, to have, if Pepper, if you could um, take a look at how Judge Grierson's suggestions might work, where it's up to the state to, um, and also maybe if you want to get whoever would represent your victims advocates within the state's attorney's office. I don't know if there's somebody who represents them or if you do. I, I might speak to that, Pepper, and that is that we, out of our office, we actually do weekly updates to the advocates so okay. they know what is happening. All right. So um, if, uh, I would like to invite the Network Against Domestic Violence Sexual Assault. I'm just like, I'd like to have the network here next week if possible, Peggy, and also Perhaps you could represent at that point the victim's advocates and what you hear from them. Yes, and I can certainly ask them if they have somebody they would like to have testify about this and, and get with Peggy. If I can send her an email if they they do have somebody they want to have speak. Other questions for Chris? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Bryn, can we just summarize where we're at before we take a break? Because I may have lost track of where we're at. We've had a lot of good suggestions, but some of them might, <clears throat> might not be as good as others. So it sounds to me like we're the, the witnesses are going to get together in the next week before you take this up again next Thursday and come up with um, some suggestions for the committee on a few issues. <clears throat> I can talk about the ones that I heard. Yeah, if you would, please. Sure. So I heard that there was some conversation about um, the review being an administrative review as opposed to a judicial review. Um, you also heard testimony that perhaps the review should be at the minimum sentence as opposed to the midpoint or perhaps the midpoint of the maximum sentence. I thought that was the midpoint um, for those ordered till further order of the court, but the midpoint of the sentence. I think yeah. that's right for indeterminate sentences. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but I, I, I I still think people should go before the court, whether it's the state presenting it or the any opposition or who, who determines whether or not, um, by, uh, if you continue the clear and convincing standard, um, and that I don't wanna lose the courts, the person coming before the court, the court saying, yes, we believe you've completed 
and thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Um, hopefully you'll continue, you know, we're gonna release you from probation now and hopefully you'll continue to do well. I think there's a certain impact there for the offender and I'd hate to lose that. I also think that if the person shouldn't be released, it's always nice to have the judge say, um, based upon the argument from probation and parole, we don't think you should be released. I, I just I've always found that my experience with kids was it was pretty effective having the judge tell them, even if the judge just agreed with what the state was proposing. That's just my personal. Okay, so I'll keep I'll keep reviewing the suggestions that you heard. Um, I think that you heard there was sounds like there's some consensus around defaulting to discharge unless there's required um, programming or curriculum that needs to be completed, and then that needs that rehabilitative or risk reduction programming would need to be completed before the person is discharged. Sounds like there's some consensus about that. Nope. Um, and then you heard that, um, I think there was a suggestion from the department that rather than having the review take place every six months, if a person is ineligible for discharge, um, have the department review the person um, anytime the probationer completes a condition of probation. Yeah, I, we were trying to avoid unless, uh, work for the department, but if the department's willing to do that, I think that's fine. That's too much. And then, then you heard some, um, we, you heard from the department about changing that, participating in the case plan to some kind of language about completing the conditions of probation or in some way make that driven by conditions as opposed to a case plan. And it sounds like there may yeah. be um, some suggestions coming about what appropriate language is there. Yep. And then you heard um, from Judge Grierson that the language about best interest, the court making a determination about the best interest of the person, um, that's pretty vague and we may need to get more specific there. Um, and also- Yeah, I, I think Judge Grierson made a good point of, and I didn't pick that up when I first read it. Um, discharge is not in the best interest of the person. I didn't pick it up when we first drafted that. And then also, I believe he offered a suggestion that um, that the sentence be modified if the person isn't eligible for a dismissal or a discharge at that six midpoint review. I think he said conditions be modified. Right, rather than modifying the sentence, modify. Rather than modifying the sentence. Right. And that that, that is the I think. That's mostly what I what I captured. I think you got everything. You got more than I thought. Is there, Joe? Yeah, Senator I don't Benny. know if you, I don't know if I was the only one concerned, and, and I don't think you spoke about it, Bryn. But the phrase or attain goals as matched up against completing or or satisfying probationary conditions. I thought that was bringing some confusion in, and I heard Dale Crook say he agreed with that. I don't know if uh, anybody else had that same concern. Yeah, I think that kind of ties into what we were just talking about, Judge Pearson's suggestion, because as you know, that's an existing law that um, either attaining goals or completing certain conditions can lead to a, a, a partial reduction or a deduction from the remainder of the person's term. So it sounds like there may be an idea to move away from, from that changing up the underlying sentence and instead reevaluate the conditions. Yeah, I just don't want to leave it so that probation has it in its authority to pick and choose between those two things. And while I agree the judge uh, brought up a good point, I, I want us to be clear about the message we're sending to probation about what their obligations are. And I used an example earlier of probation saying, well, yeah, you've met your conditions, but we don't like the fact that you're going to be couch surfing. Um, to me, that's a, a goal of probation, but it's not 
a probation condition as ordered by the court. So I just, I want to see if we can't clean that up somehow. Others? So just so we can, oh, well, we've got a couple of minutes and I'm gonna have a little longer break than we intended. Um, wanted to make clear what I'm talking about. Next Friday, you're going to see on the agenda an item, and many of those that are in the room right now will also be invited to testify um, or to, to join in the discussion. Aggressive behavior of juveniles, danger to staff. That that subject um, may not describe what, I, what, what we're really looking for, but I am increasingly concerned about the aggressive behavior of some of the juveniles who are in the system. We touched on it a little bit this week, I'm talking about the covered bridge treatment program. But uh, I've heard from a number of, uh, particularly yesterday, talking with uh, Pepper and John Campbell about some of the cases they're seeing and the inability. Um, discussed briefly the, the case up um, where the child wasn't able to be transported to a program because there were no sheriff's transport wasn't available and two caseworkers ended up supervising the kid in the motel and uh, one of them got assaulted. I think that it's important that we talk about this and that we start to look um, to the Department of uh, children and families, but also the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Age, uh, Aging and Disabilities uh, as well uh, about uh, this problem. Um, before it ends up being some kid who's 18 who's now um, continuing in the juvenile system and there's no place for that child. And, you know, I just want to get ahead of the problem and not be behind it. Senator White. We've been asked to take that up um, by VSEA in government operations because we deal with the with state employees, but I think that it's more appropriate. You mean the case of the assault or? Yeah, the, and the assaults and how we're going to deal with that in terms of state employees, but I think that it's more appropriate to have the major conversation here. And then if there's anything we need to do, we'll follow your lead. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think, I mean, the fact that the, the reason the two caseworkers were forced to deal with the child in a motel room was because transport to Bennington wasn't available. Right. So if there were a problem that we should be looking at, we should also be looking at why sheriff's transports aren't available. The opening was there. They, um, fortunately, that happens. Uh, for those of you who are still here, and um, I had invited Marshall Paul, but Matt, you're welcome instead. But, um, I think we need to have this discussion. Senator Sears, look what I have for you. Oh my God, great. Thank you. Thank you. You were able to get into the Judiciary Committee room? Yep, they're open. And if, if they're my not chair open, fits in your car, could you bring it down? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I can do that. That was a joke, folks. <laughs> okay. Um, any Anything else before we take a break? And we're going to hear from uh, Dr. 1045. I lost his name here. It's um, doctor, a doctor, Doctor Sexton, regarding S thirty, the bill that prohibits firearms in childcare facilities. Okay, thank you. We'll get back at uh, try to get back here a little before ten forty five. 